Well, welcome everyone. And we have a special guest today. This is Charles Lupica. He is a international award winner photographer. He is the founder of 256 Shades of Grey, a master in the Arcanum, and just an all around good guy. And as you can see, he is in Shades of Grey right now, which is his contest for Viewbug that he will be judging for us. And what we're going to be talking today is all about perfecting your grayscale images. So Charles is going to take us through some of his own images, talk about what he's looking for in a winning image. And we want to wish you the best of luck in this exciting contest. So Charles, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's uh, great to be here. Great. You want to tell us a little bit about you, a little background uh, before we get started here? Well, you know, I think uh, my journey in photography is the journey of so many people that I come across, and, you know, and, and so I want to relate a bit of that. You know, I loved photography when I was young. I did huge amounts of photography, and then over the years as, uh, you know, career and family and other things kind of uh, intruded on, on those things, the, the photography kind of fell away. But then, you know, in 2000, we, uh, we had, a, had a son and uh, our first and only child and well kind of got to document that you know so I got back into photography a little more but not real deeply but then in 2007 well I always took film you know and uh, and I took black and white film mostly and then in 2007 we went to uh, up for a vacation in Portugal and I came back from Portugal with four rolls of black and white uh, images uh, and it cost me about two hundred and fifty dollars. It was like, wow, that's a dollar and a quarter an image. So then it was like, no, I got to go digital. You know, I, I got to go digital. Of course, now you know it's probably twenty dollars an image if you include all the things. That... That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it probably is not, but I probably spent twenty times as much anyway. I just have you know a hundred times as many images, but. Uh, I still spent a lot of money on photography, but you know. So in 2007, I picked up a camera. And I started taking uh, a lot of digital images. I started uh, uh, working. I think we. I don't know if we mentioned it, but I. Uh, well, I'm an award-winning photographer. I won the award for my book, Grand Angle sur la Collégia de Neuchâtel. And then, you know, from there, it, it's been a journey of, you know, but all of that. Most of those pictures, were, they were still in. They were in color, and uh, and that's part of the journey I think that many of us have taken. We, 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 in the days of black and white, we had black and white film in our camera, and as long as there was black and white film in the camera, I, I could think in black and white. But as soon as I had a digital camera and it's taking all these pictures and colors, it's like my brain just wouldn't wouldn't, uh, wouldn't work on that anymore. It's like it's a color camera. I'm taking color pictures. You're not taking any black and white, but after a couple of years of doing, you know, starting on uh, Google Plus and uh, doing lots of other things and seeing beautiful work of the other photographers in black and white on Google Plus, I decided it was time to rediscover my own art. And uh, not too long after that, I started, uh, I, well, I started several photography themes on Google Plus dealing with black and white photography. And then from there, I started the uh, uh, the online learning community, which is now called 256 Shades of Grey. Charles, you're going to be showing us some of your own images and along the way sharing some tips for these folks that are entering the black and white contest, Shades of Grey, and also for anybody who's interested in black and white. So I'm sure we're going to learn a lot from you, so I'm really excited to see what you have to show us. Let's. Uh, we'll start with uh, this image here. This. Uh, if, uh, let me go to the, uh, this is the before image and uh, this is the after image. We'll talk about the before image a little bit here because this is something that uh, I talk about often. Uh, I've made several posts uh, about this and uh, this technique and also made a couple of videos about it. But this, this uh, plant was uh, just on the side of a, a path that I was walking down in the woods. Uh, I don't even remember where. Now Italy, I think. And uh, I saw this beautiful plant. Uh, it's a clematis, and uh, I had to go back and look it up, of course. But uh, it was just beautiful. And of course, you know, you don't really want to disturb these things. I mean, 
you're you're out. Uh, we were out in a camping car. I'm not going to cut the bush off and take it back to the to the camper and uh, try to do photography of it. So, what I do is I always carry a piece of black satin cloth in my backpack, in my camera bag, and I have some little spring-loaded A clips, and uh, I'll clip I'll clip the uh, the cloth uh, onto anything that's convenient, and then I'll take a picture so that uh, I have a naturally occurring uh, on black picture. That is really clever. Right. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, you know, and the thing is, because when you go into Photoshop or something and you try to to clip an image out of the background, it's really difficult, uh, especially you know if you've got if the tones are close. Uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to uh, cut something out, but when you've got the black already, you, you're 80% you're of the way there, and it's so easy. It's just a piece of black satin cloth, uh, a couple of A-clips, and uh, you know, just set up your tripod and take a picture. I mean, uh, I will say that I don't take very many pictures uh, without a tripod. My tripod is always with me. And so I, I set the tripod up, I clip the, uh, the cloth on, and I take a set of pictures. And then I bring it back uh, into Photoshop, and uh, I'll uh, clean it up, maybe add, like here I probably added a, a gradient so it uh, just trails off the canvas a little bit. This particular image uh, was the cover image of July uh, 2013 magazine, uh, Artist Culture magazine. And uh, it was a cover photo, and they did a feature article on my photography, so I was real happy with that. Very good. That's a great so, tip. I love that. So the the next three images here, these are some images that I've shown on my uh, Google profile, and I think uh, uh, maybe a place or two else. Uh, it's in my Meet the Master video for my... Uh, video on the Arcanum. So we'll start with this. This is actually probably only one image of a sequence of, of, of three to five, image, five images because I seldom, I, I, as I said earlier, I almost always shoot on a tripod and secondly I almost always uh, shoot uh, uh, three to five images. Uh, this also appears to be a little bit of a long exposure because you can see the smoothness in the water. Uh, the next thing is uh, I brought it in, I processed it, I've added some light, there's a little, bit of haze, a little haloing in here that I'm not too, too happy with at this point. You can see where I had uh, more than my fair share of dirt on uh, the lens, some, some uh, squiggly hairs here and some other things. Uh, shame on me. <laughs> and, uh, here I'm uh, almost there. I think I could probably do just a little bit more with cleaning up the halos here, but you can see significantly reduced. The, the sky has now been uh, made more dramatic, and there's uh, uh, just, you know, the light, there's a lot more punch to it. One of the things that uh, I do for an image like this is I'll, after I've done most of the processing, I'll go back in to, uh, and I use Photoshop, Lightroom, and primarily the Nick Collection. But I'll take the uh, converted image back into uh, Color Effects Pro 4, and I will add a light and darken uh, center filter to it. And it's it's a vignette of sorts, but it's so much more subtle than than vignetting tools. And what that does is it just tones down all the corners and helps draw the viewer's eye right to where you want them to be looking, which is right here in the center of the image. Now, one of the things I will say is this is not a finished image, even though it looks like it would be a finished image. Uh, we come back to the one before it. You can see we have this guy in here, so he's he's got to go. And we've removed him by the time we've gotten to here. But one thing that really bothers me about this picture is these little white spots that are, you know, stones glistening in the sand. Well, these pull my eye away from the image. And this is, uh, this is something to really uh, keep in mind because when I go to judge images, when I'm looking at a pair of images that are very close, that I can't, I'm having a hard time deciding which is the better image, and I see a hot spot like this, this image is going to lose out because these things take away from the image. They pull my eye 
away from where I want the viewer to be looking, and therefore they're not they're not good. And I always I tell people I tell my apprentices that things that don't add to the picture take away from it, and these white bright stones they're taking away from this image in a significant way. So attention to detail is really important. Yeah, and I think you brought up a really good point. It could be an artistically fabulous image, but if there's something technically off, like you said, these little hot spots or maybe the horizon's tilted, that can sway your your judging of the winner. So uh, that's something to be really uh, well aware of. So thank you for oh, sharing it's not, that. Oh, that, that horizon's straight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it better be. <laughs> <laughs> now the clouds are a little crooked. But... <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, Charles, where was this? This is Bandon Beach, or is this um, over in uh, Washington, or where Yeah, is this is in Washington. Uh, this is in the Olympic National Park. Okay. But this is, uh, I want to say it's uh, Rudy Beach, but it could be Rialto. I'm pretty sure it's Rudy Beach, though. Okay. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's Rudy Beach. So, yeah, the uh, the. The, the everybody loves the Oregon coast and it's certainly close to uh, a lot of population but uh, uh, the Pacific the Washington coast it can be uh, pretty uh, very beautiful as well mm -hmm. so now we'll come to another set of images and uh, so you can see the before and the after and uh, I think maybe we'll go back and uh, you know you can't really get a good sense but you can see there's a big difference between these two images especially in the height of the, uh, of the Old Faithful. So here it's there, and uh, it's a bit more dramatic here. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's a, kind of a little artistic liberty, but uh, nobody would ever know uh, because it looks real. It looks like what you would expect from the geyser. And what's more, this image looks very unimpressive. I mean, because the geyser itself doesn't look all that imposing. It's like the little spurt of water. It's like, so what, you know? Mm. And uh, so, you know, it's made much more dramatic uh, by by doing, uh, by just uh, using Photoshop to stretch it just a little bit. And, uh, uh, nothing too much, but enough that it really gives the image a lot more impact. Mm. And another thing here that's an important thing in terms of working with tools to, to create black and white images is you can see that the sky is pretty blue here. Well that's a big advantage when you want to go to a black sky. And the reason that is is because when you go into any of the editing tools uh, that are specifically designed to work uh, with black and white conversion like uh, Silver Effects Pro, you can add a red filter onto your image and when you add a red filter to a blue sky it turns it black. And so it gives you this really deep black contrast. And the deeper the blue, the blacker the sky. So it's, it's, it can really uh, produce some very dramatic images. So now we're in the, this next pair of images right here in the center uh, shows a little bit of some more uh, Photoshop trickery. Here's the uh, before image. And here's the after image. And you can see in the before image, there's not a cloud in sight. Not a cloud anywhere. It was a very gray day. I mean, this this is, uh, I mean, this is already converted, but I mean, this is a total gray out. It was, it was a pretty nasty day, to be honest, but uh, uh, anyway. So, because it was such a uniformly gray day, it was very easy to go into Photoshop, add a mask, and just remove the entire gray sky. Uh, certainly, there's other ways that th this can be done, uh, but for me, the simplest way, for when the edges are very clean like this, it's just going to make a simple mask and, and it's gone in five minutes. Well, I also keep on file uh, cloud images. So the sky in this picture was you know, just absolutely nothing. And so I went into my cloud library, I found a suitable cloud, and uh, it probably was not a long exposure cloud, although I do have some. And I probably uh, used Photoshop to, to stretch the cloud and add it into this picture. So I call this uh, a false long exposure. And uh, you know, I, you know, it's, I used to go out a lot and do you know lots and lots of uh, of the architectural sort of photography from the 
you know, this uh, buildings like these and that. And to get a day where the, the weather is just perfect to get uh, the clouds that you want with that building, it could take a, it could take years to, to time it just right to have the clouds that you want. But you know, it finally dawned on me. You know, why am I sitting here? You know, for hours on end taking pictures that that I have a reasonably good sense are not quite what I want when I know I've got this really cool library of clouds and all I need to do is hone my Photoshop skills enough to be able to put those clouds into this picture convincingly. And of course now that everybody knows that you just pasted in there, they'll have all the, they'll look at this and they'll see all the reasons why it, it probably uh, is not a real image. but. Uh, uh, Without telling people, they generally don't realize that that you've uh, pasted the sky in like this. So, so more often than not these days, I, I don't worry about it. I go and I have fun taking uh, pictures of these buildings and try to shoot all these odd angles and find light on the sides of the buildings that I like, and then I'll worry about the clouds uh, on another day. So. Very good. Yeah, I assumed that that was a long exposure. But, you know, we should not <laughs> assume anything. <laughs> no, you know, this is something else I like to tell people. Uh, uh, it's sort of a mantra of mine is, uh, uh, I always say, nothing is real. <laughs> right. These days that's you know, true. In, in, <laughs> no, in modern photography, no matter, you know, no matter how much you, you think it's real, unless you created it to yourself, there's always some doubt about whether it's real. So let's just... Uh, this gives an idea of what uh, one of the source images might have been like. Okay, you can see again a pretty uh, a pretty ugly day. Here is even a water drop on my uh, lens that I eventually had to clone out. Here's maybe uh, another water drop on the lens, or potentially a, uh, it's, it might be a cloud, or it might be a spot on my uh, on my sensor. And uh, so you can see here. Here's another. Uh, here, these are water drops. They're not sensor spots, uh, and uh, I'm not sure about that one. Uh, it could be a sensor spot, but at any rate, uh, uh, not a very nice day. So here is the image. The image was an HDR vertorama, which is to say, it's uh, rather than normally uh, like a panorama, you're you're panning. In a vertorama, you're stacking the images vertically. So this is probably, uh, I think this is nine images, three on top, three in the middle, three on the bottom, uh, and uh, those were processed with HDR software to get the, what I thought was the best exposure from uh, from those nine different images. Then the nine images were blended with uh, uh, PT GUI, uh, PT GUI, uh, and uh, it's what I prefer for the more difficult uh, blending. So it's a vertorama, and then here it is uh, uh, in the final image. This image is currently showing in a uh, in an exposition in the Netherlands. So uh, quite quite happy with this image, and. Uh, well, the sky here, you know, with our previous conversation, the sky here all looks like I faked it in. And uh, in this case, it actually is there. <laughs> so uh, it wasn't this dramatic. I mean, if you, you can barely see that the, that the sky is there in this picture. But if you look closely, you can see how I haven't really changed the lines of, of the clouds. They are really kind of uh, angled in on this building. and pulling in and the, the lights back here and even the street is uh, lit up in a way that seems inconsistent with the lighting but it's only uh, some minor uh, my my friend uh, Jean-Michel Misery uh, he asked me about this the other day he says you know this this light doesn't look quite real you know and I said well I don't know I, I I don't think I enhanced it very much and so you know looking uh, you just never know. Sometimes some things are real, and sometimes they're not. That's right. Uh, it's it's more real here than you would think. So, <laughs> so here's the original, uh, the original color image that I this was in Zion uh, National Park this uh, past summer, and uh, so uh, this is truly a long exposure. You can see the uh, the blurring of the clouds here. Uh, I can't. I don't remember the exact uh, length of the exposure, but probably around two minutes. 
Uh, this uh, I use the the, uh, the Lee filters, the leader Lee filter system, and uh, I have a ten stop filter and a six stop filter, and quite frequently both filters are on the camera. In this case. Uh, both filters were on the camera, and in addition to that, I had a, a 0.6 graduated uh, neutral density filter uh, stacked on uh, as a third filter on the set, so that uh, the the base of the image would be uh, uh, lighter than it might normally be, and uh, it would keep the sky from blowing out. So it gets a bit tricky when you start stacking three filters, but. Uh, uh, here it is. Uh, after I processed it a little bit, you see I've uh, pumped up the colors. I've probably taken it into Color Effects Pro and done the uh, used the tonal contrast filter. I've done uh, some manipulations here to to make the blue sky bluer because I know I want to go into when I go into my black and white conversion. I want to put a red filter on this so that I can really. Uh, drive the, uh, the the blue to black. So I've tried to heighten the blue. There's a number of ways you can do that. Sometimes you know you can use uh, uh, some of, some of the weird duotones and some other. I can't I can't really give you a, a specific on that. But you know, play with filters. You find one that will do what you need. Sometimes you know when you go when you know you're going to do black and white, you can make the color look horrible, and it will be a beautiful black and white image. So so you've got to try to. Think in black and white, and just think in terms of contrast and shape and form, and, and sort of not worry too much about the color because you're going to get rid of it anyway. So here's uh, here's the image now. I've gone in. You can see how black I've made the sky. I've been able to drive it down so that it just gives us really uh, the white clouds against the black sky just become uh, really uh, sharp and crisp. The mountain stands out and. Uh, the cloud has really taken on some shape here. It uh, just uh, really uh, looks kind of—I don't know. <laughs> I think it looks a little bit like a rocket, you know. But <laughs> pretty much, <laughs> you know. But uh, and there again, you know, it's just a consequence of uh, of the long exposure and adding some contrast to it. So here's where some uh, the big trickery comes in. You can see once again if you look between the two. Um, that there's a substantial difference in the the height of the mountain. You know, it's not a different photograph. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, again, you know, I've looked at this. I've, uh, you know, it's it's the nothing is real principle, and it's also the uh, it's my art. And you know, I like to say that uh, I'm not a photographer. I'm an artist with a camera. And this is my art, and this is my interpretation. Because when I'm standing there looking up at this peak. It looms over me, and I, I feel you know this, this massive uh, mountain in front of me. And this picture doesn't convey that sense of, of, of size and magnificence to me. And while it's an okay picture, it just doesn't have that final little wow, you know. And so I went into Photoshop and uh, I stretched the mountain a little bit. And it was a little more difficult than I expected because the clouds, I needed to stretch the mountain without stretching the clouds. So, that, you know, so there's a little issues in here. But, but, you know, I think that's, you know, that's another thing, you know, where when people are judging photography, they're looking for things that are different. They're looking for that unique image that, that just somehow speaks to them. This image doesn't speak to me. Uh, as it is, because it just doesn't have enough presence. And if it doesn't speak to me, it's not going to speak to other people very well either. And so I've got to look at this and say, well, as nice of an image as this is, what can I do to make this image nicer? Now I can say, well, it really is like this. I shouldn't be messing with it. And I can say, you know, I pulled the, I, I boosted the color. And then I removed all the color after I turned it all the blue black, and now I'm going to worry about reality. It's kind of like, does this make sense? And so, you know, it's it's uh, it's something that uh, that Joel Tinchelar says. You know, that it's one of the his base principles is that uh, you know, uh, when you remove the color from something, you have taken one step away from reality. So the next thing, you know, is this this set. Uh, this is going to be a panorama. Horseshoe Bend, you know, uh, let's bring up this picture. You don't ever see Horseshoe Bend in black and white. It's always in color. And so 
you know, my aim when I went to Horseshoe Bend was, I am going to go here. I am going to think like Ansel Adams. I'm going to think that all I have is a black and white camera, and what I need to do is I need to capture this scene in a way that I can represent it in black and white, and people will believe that this is Horseshoe Bend uh, without the color. That it doesn't need the color to be a magnificent uh, place to go and, and set a camera. I would point out one, one little flaw in this image. This little dot here is a boat. And I hate that dot in this picture because, again, you know, it takes away. It draws my eye. I go right to this boat every time I look at this picture. And, and so, you know, if I was judging this again, you know, I would, I, my eye would just come right to that and I'd say, man, that guy should have cloned that out. <laughs> But you can see how high you are up. I mean, like, it's real depth and perception there with that little boat. Oh, yeah. it's it's. Uh, my, my son was standing behind me saying, Dad, get away from the edge, Dad. Dad, you're too <laughs> close to the edge. And I'm saying, hey, don't worry about it, William. I have terrible vertigo anyway. I'm not going any closer. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, I thought it was a miracle that I got that close. It, here in this picture, though, you can get a uh, – there may be a better one here to, to get a sense uh, – well, I guess you can't really get a good sense there, of, uh, but of how close the tripod is. But it's pretty close. That's only you know, maybe 18 inches from the edge, and this is a thousand feet from from here to here, if I recall, uh, something like a thousand feet. It may not be that much, but it, it's significant. So, part of the rationale behind choosing this picture to share on my on my Google Plus uh, stream, but also here, is because of the people here, it's not just about uh, the Horseshoe Bend. Everybody shares a picture of the Horseshoe Bend. This is about all of the people that are there taking pictures and looking at the Horseshoe Bend. You've got a group of crazy guys over here out on the uh, cliff edge, uh, and they were much further out earlier. I think one of them actually went all the way out on the edge of the cliff, and it's like, no, I don't even want to watch this guy, you know. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, these other people, this guy looking down, this woman here talking to her friends that are behind her, who, who probably didn't want to get any closer to the edge. And, uh, you know, one of the things I was saying earlier when I was talking about uh, uh, Horseshoe Bend, uh, getting down on the ground, laying there, hanging my camera over the edge, you know, one thing that people just don't seem to think of is trying to change the perspective. You know, 98% of all photographs are taken at eye level. And, you know, bending down or stepping up on top of something or trying to find that, an angle that's different than what everybody else is taking is, uh, is something we just don't seem to think of. And, and I'm often reminded, you know, when I'm talking about the subject, I'm often reminded of, of the image of Ansel Adams with his tripod on top of his woody. Right. And, uh, and we don't think of this because we go to these same places that Ansel took pictures and, and we stand there with our tripods and we take these pictures and somehow we just don't have the same uh, point of view or something that Ansel had and uh, that's because he was six feet above us. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> in stature, of course, he was, uh, you know, a hundred feet above or more, but in terms of yeah. uh, where he physically took the pictures, he was always six feet above everybody else, you know, so he always had a different perspective on things. That's so it's, true. It's, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing that, you know, just getting down on a knee sometimes, uh, it, you know, changing the perspective by a couple of feet can make a, a lot of difference in how you view the world. Absolutely. And it's certainly, you know, it's, you know, and it's certainly... Uh, important when you're shooting children and animals and stuff that you, you bring the camera down to their level. Shooting down, uh, you know, that's another thing. You know, pictures when you're shooting down on something in a contest, they're just usually not going to fare very well uh, because uh, it's not an angle that we generally find uh, aesthetically pleasing. Well, this has been a real treat, uh, being able to see some of your images and getting some insights into what you're looking for in a winning black and white image. So, Charles, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for inviting me. All right. Thank you.